We're here today with Yi Tao, who is a fellow at the Roland Institute at Harvard University, and Peter Wadhams, who is a professor emeritus at Cambridge University and at Turin Polytechnic. And we're going to talk about some fantastic possibilities for mitigating the climate crisis. Uh, both of you have wonderful ideas for what we could do if we just would have the will and put our money in the right place. Um, Peter, would you like to start? The problem is that we've got to find a way to save the world. We can't do it entirely by reducing carbon emissions. Unfortunately, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is still obsessed with reducing emissions to the exclusion of everything else. Um, the enormous danger that we're in now with, with this climate emergency requires immediate action. But the trouble is that the immediate action that is recommended by IPCC is entirely reducing the consumption of fossil fuels and reducing their emissions. So radiation balance and the direct removal of CO2 need to be there to modify our climate to make it more bearable, whereas reducing emissions of carbon dioxide are simply not going to be enough. We have to actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and or change the radiation balance of the planet so that we are cooled down by emitting more radiation from the surface. So uh, here is a very simple model of how uh, climate change works uh, under the current uh, driving by atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases, uh, such as uh, carbon dioxide. We can uh, conceptualize both the, uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere and also the heat uh, in the uh, Earth's biosphere as this sort of uh, containers or a funnel, as, as you will. And for both the CO2, funnel and to the heat funnel, we have a rate, uh, RS, that's the source rate coming in and a rate at which uh, the CO2 get absorbed by the ocean or the trace, the sink rate or the rate RK that's in red, the rate at which heat leaves the atmosphere. So what happened uh, on earth was uh, because we started to burn uh, fossil fuel, we increased the rate of input into the atmosphere. And that has led to uh, and growth in the size of this uh, the amount of CO2 trapped in the funnel. And the, uh, the coupling between uh, carbon dioxide and the heat, which is actually the parameter that's important, that's affecting and impacting the climate and ecosystems, is that a larger, uh, uh, the carbon dioxide node shrinks uh, the sink rate of heat from the earth system. And when you have this uh, imbalance uh, for the heat node, we consequently have an increase uh, in the amount of heat that's trapped and that's doing all the damage. Uh, so essentially, uh, we basically have four knobs to tackle the problem. There's the how much we burn, which is the source rate for CO2. There's a how much we can take in out uh, via, say, direct air capture, which is the sink rate for CO2. Or we can target uh, the rate at which heat comes in and rate at which heat uh, go out. And uh, it just so happens that it's essentially not possible on human or generational timescale to uh, increase the sink rate of CO2 from the atmosphere to have a measurable impact on the current trajectory of the climate. Uh, because in a sense, it's an indirect knob we're trying to tackle. The, the, the real knob or the node that's important is the heat that's trapped in the atmosphere, not the CO2. So we have been as a species collectively looking at the wrong uh, you know, part of the, the the picture. We have to be focusing on uh, thermal overshoot, not really CO2, because it's an indirect knob and that's much more difficult for many practical reasons. Peter, is that, is that how you think of it too? Do you agree with that? I think the heat problem is a very important one in the sense that we do have a direct way of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with various air capture methods that will actually help. Now, when people first started to realize that they couldn't solve the problem by reducing carbon emissions, and not everybody realizes that yet, the next idea was, let's look at CO2, what's causing, which is what's causing the heating. So let's take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. 
and it can be done. And if we put a big enough effort in and build a huge number of systems for removing CO2, that will be one route to our salvation. But there are others which depend on reducing the amount of energy generated on the planet as opposed to energy reflected. You both have very interesting projects. Um, Peter, um, marine cloud brightening is one. And uh, Yi, I believe you have an idea of a spa of a mirror, <laughs> a mylar surface that would reflect back. And not the mylar. The we, are, we don't want oh. anything plastic. So everything okay. we target are for durability over decades to century timescales. So that's a very, very key in tackling this long-term problem because we have to match uh, the lifetime and duration durability of the solution to the lifetime of the problem, which in the end is the longevity of the CO2 in the atmosphere, which is over century to millennia timescales. So what is the material that you're suggesting to use for the reflectivity? Uh, so essentially rocks, molten rocks, or a uh, different kind of uh, glass for some sensitive uh, uh, device layer. Uh, molten rocks that become reflective on a large scale? Uh, essentially, yes, because of the, um, the scale of the problem. So that's the major challenge that many people working in the, in the field neglect. Uh, so for example, one example is direct air capture. Yes, it works in principle in lab and one can uh, you know, make profit on small scale. But if you really think about the scale of the problem, it's essentially basically not scalable. We'd have to invest, invest you know, the um, energy usage and material usage of the US military for 6,000 years in order to accomplish the task. And it's uh, unlikely that the world can come together to mount an operation close to, say, the U.S. military in the next decade or so. And even so, we need 6,000 years to accomplish the task of CO2 capture from the air. So from engineering perspective, uh, uh, that's a no-go. So direct air capture will never uh, have any measurable impact on the trajectory of, human, of the climate. It can have you know, um, a, a profitability margin, and people within this capitalist uh, economy are trying to you know, leverage that to, to make, make a profit. But uh, from a really tackling the core of the problem, it's a, it's a no-go. Um, I wouldn't agree with that because you do want to couple direct uh, air capture with reducing your carbon emissions. So if we're emitting 42 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year, and we want to stop the climate from warming, then one way is to spend a huge amount of money on direct air capture and get rid of 42 gigatons. But another way is to, to reduce emissions by say a half, then that would take 20 gigatons out from reduced emissions. And that leaves us 22 to take out by direct air capture. That brings the cost of the direct air capture down. While we have pretty much used our carbon budget or very close to using up what we can actually put in the atmosphere. We're, we're trying desperately to save ourselves and to buy ourselves some time. Um, so we know that you know, during World War II, the, the whole United States economy shifted immediately to a wartime economy. And that would be what I imagine we would <laughs> best one to see is that we shifted our resources now to everything we can do to slow this process down. Uh, but the ultimate goal is, is to stop putting all this carbon in the air. I think it's, it's yes, it's very important, you know, to stop uh, further emissions and uh, uh, carbon capture and storage at source. Yes, that's uh, should be encouraged and research in that area must be encouraged. What I uh, think is questionable is direct capture from the air because there are intrinsic fundamental physical limits uh, limited by the laws of therm thermodynamics that prevents that from being feasible. And specifically, it's the entropy of mixing. Once we allow exhaust gas to escape into the atmosphere and be diluted, if you want to recapture and purify that CO2, there's the energy cost that's associated with that that's not surmountable by engineering because it's, it's a fundamental limitation. And that fundamental limitation makes direct capture from air uh, irrelevant for confronting the climate crisis. So research money should not be directed to um, direct air capture, but to uh, capture at source, yes. Uh, so that's something I wanted to add.
Well, the IPCC report talked about methane and um, capturing that as it's been escaping um, from various uh, sources, uh, one of which, of course, is agriculture, um, where we could actually have an immediate impact by changing to plant-based diets around the world, um, would have many, many benefits, but one of them is limiting uh, the, the release of methane from cow uh, flatulence and, and burping, but uh, also from all of the aspects of, of the uh, animal agriculture, the refrigeration, the growing of seeds, the use of land. There's also the ocean, and I think you had a, a project of uh, liming the ocean with uh, more shell fish and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so the ocean acidification problem is a problem which is less urgent than the thermal ones. But in uh, at the project, we still work on it because uh, we, you know, we're working towards a long-term solution, and one of which is to eventually be able to capture back that CO two in the environment using the most efficient method. And the reason why we want to work with uh, marine bivalves is that the shells of these creatures are the most dense and concentrated form of carbon. And the process of that concentration is powered by solar energy through the phytoplankton. So marine bivalves are filter feeders and they feed on these uh, uh, algae, which are essentially provided for free if you choose the location for aquaculture wisely. And then uh, the shells are essentially 40% like uh, CO2, which are get transported for free uh, with a high value uh, marine bivalves, oysters, clams, and uh, scallops uh, to human consumers. So they get a free ride all the way uh, to processing locations. And the, it's possible to use uh, solar energy then to isolate the CO2 and then perform on-site carbon capture and the storage. And then the, the calcium oxide part of the shell can then be returned um, uh, to the ocean in order to make such that there's no net transfer of material other than carbon from the ocean into whatever storage facility you can develop. So this uh, proposal is very different from traditional uh, ocean liming methods because traditional ocean liming are calling for mining rocks from mountains from uh, other quarry in order to have a net transfer of mineral into the ocean, which in the long term will uh, affect ocean uh, uh, composition. In our scheme, we're working with uh, nature to use uh, the calcium oxide that's endemic to the ocean already as sort of a conceptual pump or catalyst, if you will, uh, to basically pump in a cyclic way the CO2 from uh, the atmosphere dissolved into the ocean, captured by phytoplankton, transferred to the marine bivalve, and transported for free to shore for human consumption. So at the same time, we also encourage a transition from land-based agriculture of protein, including like beef, as we mentioned, to a more seafood or um, just, you know, uh, bivalve-based uh, protein. Mm -hmm. And that way we can have additional benefits in CO2 reduction and methane emissions reduction. So we have uh, been working with a NASA data set uh, looking at the phytoplankton concentration. And we estimate um, that it's uh, entirely feasible to scale uh, the flux of this pump to on the order of two to three uh, percent global current uh, emissions, and the CO two that we you know capture through this loop, uh, if we use the newest um, electrochemical uh, reactions to reduce them into uh, to fuel like a biofuel sort of real uh, contemporary shell biofuel. Well, we're interested in oysters and the use of those. Um, we're working with a company which actually cultivates oysters, and the company is called Bear Native, which is the name of a species of oyster that was uh, used in Roman times. There's a lot, a lot of history in the part of the world where we're working because the company is based in Colchester. This was an ancient Roman city, and it was the centre of oyster production in Roman times. It was the place where oysters were exported from Britain to Rome. Um, so the, the use of, of oyster shell is uh, a way of, of increasing the removal of carbon dioxide 
through um, a reaction going on in the ocean. So uh, this project on ocean deacidification by working with nature and coupling to food system is uh, for a long-term vision, but we want to stress that in order to get to that stage, uh, the most urgent need of which is to, to maintain habitats for uh, humans for our food system. And that we can be very efficiently uh, performed using land-based mirrors uh, interspersed into agricultural fields. Right. So, so, yeah, so there are many uh, you know, physical constraints that's limiting uh, our ability to make an impact. Speed at which these things can be implemented is one major constraint. And also the volume they have to handle and the energetic uh, problem. So as an illustration, uh, the problem we're tackling is essentially this uh, planetary energy imbalance. And in numbers, that's uh, like 400, uh, 450 uh, uh, terawatts of power. So uh, to give a point of reference, human civilization dissipates 18 terawatts. So the, mo the monster we're trying to confront is like 25 to 50 times bigger than what we have at our disposal, even in terms of brute force, fossil fuel power. And of course, when you, you know, burn the coal 18 terawatts and transform that into high quality electricity, we only have like one or two terawatts. So we're fighting against a problem which is two orders of magnitude bigger than fossil fuel power. So if you understand that, obviously some sort of uh, dimensional reduction or some huge leverage needs to be present in the method that you choose to tackle the problem. And uh, conceptually, the mirror reflection framework just using a surface to uh, cancel out this uh, the heating effect uh, is uh, analogous to reducing a three-dimensional problem of heat trapped by uniformly distributed three greenhouse gases, squish it down into a two-dimensional problem. And conceptually, that's the fundamental reason why we can still tackle this monster that's two orders of magnitude bigger than our brute force power, because we have this gigantic uh, squishing down of the monster and the uh, dimensional reduction. So we are uh, operating in a, with a dimensional advantage uh, if we go by this surface-based technique. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the um, effect of masking, which is occurring from uh, particles we're already putting in the air from burning fossil fuels, and the facts of, say, a volcano, Mount Pinatubo, when it exploded, put an ash over the entire world, and this lowered the temperature by, I think it was 0.6 Celsius for an entire year. Um, that would buy us a lot of time if we had a handy volcano, but since we don't, um, there's, a, there's the idea of the uh, raising the albedo of the planet in different ways, and one of these is the marine cloud brightening idea, especially over the Great Barrier Reef or over the Arctic. Um, things that we can do um, in the uh, above the ice to keep it from melting. There's a very serious problem occurring at the moment, which is the blackening of the Greenland ice cap. You've now got a distinct type of ice, which we call black ice because it's black, and it's simply the ice of the Greenland ice cap mixed with dirt, algae and dust. And now with soot, because of all the brush fires that have spread over the planet this last year, uh, what happens is that the, uh, there's always dust and dirt blowing over the Greenland ice cap. Now there's more than before. And uh, as the ice sheet melts uh, because of global warming, the ice drains away into the ocean. It drains down through the ice sheet into the ocean, but the, ice, the dirt stays in place. Um, it, it, the, the dirt stays as a surface layer. And as the ice disappears downwards, the surface layer gets darker and darker. And this is a serious problem because the darker surface um, absorbs more radiation and causes the ice sheet to warm up and melt even quicker. There's a technique developed by, in Scotland by Stephen Salter and John Latham and other brilliant engineers. It's an excellent way to um, 
allow the, the climate to be cooled because it, it, it releases tiny droplets of seawater into the bottoms of clouds. And um, those droplets cause the clouds to become brighter. Tiny droplets cause clouds to become brighter. Big droplets like uh, on, in rain clouds make the clouds darker. So we really want to have these brighter clouds which will reflect more radiation and cool the planet. So Yi, uh, you, I'd like to give you also an opportunity you know, to talk a little bit more about the, the Mir project that's working on the land to, we're all talking now about the albedo of the earth and how we can reflect back the sun's heat. Um, so certainly um, having clouds that are more effective at reflecting sunlight is a wonderful idea. And the problem in England with getting money is just the same here in America. <laughs> I'm sure you're having trouble funding your project as well. Uh, yes, uh, I think regardless of the approach from a matter of principle, solar radiation management is the only uh, approach that we have to make a measurable impact on the heating trajectory of this uh, planet. Of course, uh, but not all solar radiation management schemes are created equal, and they also do not have equal impact on other parts of the human system and ecosystem. So um, specifically, when you are, are modifying the atmosphere, you really um, impact the radiation that crops, ecosystems, and also our renewable energy infrastructures receive. So uh, approaches like um, stratospheric aerosol injection and the marine cloud brightening um, would uh, adversely uh, impact our transition to renewables because you decrease the amount of uh, solar radiation uh, that's reaching ground uniformly. So they have fairly low resolution. And uh, between uh, stratospheric aerosol injection and marine cloud brightening, uh, the former um, is feasible from energetic and the material availability points of view, but marine cloud brightening uh, may not be uh, scalable from an energy consumption point of view because of the um, uh, very short duration, lifetime of these uh, uh, aerosol induced uh, clouds of uh, the matter of days. So you have to imagine if you want to cover the whole globe, you have to have very fast uh, boats traveling great distances and diffusion of the wake of these clouds is limited in the troposphere. So you really have to do a lot of zigzagging, scanning through the oceans at high speeds. And that process is not energetically favorable. But Yi, aren't we talking, uh, I think Peter is talking about doing this in the in specific areas. Correct. Over the, so, the so Arctic. Marine, correct. So, uh, so this is uh, potentially useful for, um, uh, for small sanctuaries if you want to provide some local shielding, but it's not, uh, marine cloud branding is not easily scalable uh, to the globe. Um, so, and the other thing is, is the, the yes, it, it, it dissipates in a few days, but this is sort of an advantage if there's any problem. It's not, we're not stuck with it for uh, years yeah, as, as stratospheric um, particles uh, might be. That's correct, uh, we, should yes. we, we should explain that, you know, there are two choices here. One is to put it way up high in the stratosphere, what, 10 kilometers or so above the clouds. And the other is to actually just affect the clouds. Uh, that's correct from uh, the point of view of you, if you want to perform experiments to test the impact of these methods with the fastest time response. Yes, a short lifetime is favorable. However, remember that we are approaching this as an engineering solution to be eventually scaled up and more or less permanently there. From that point of view, stratospheric aerosol injection would be preferable. However, we would argue that the most uh, preferable method is to do it on the ground where you can basically also control how much you, how many mirrors you have it tilting up versus just fold it away and have them indefinitely stable over the cable time scales if should local testing and uh, monitoring uh, suggest that the method is viable. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Peter, what do you have to say about this? <laughs> now, I've been very worried about stratospheric release of all the methods of um, cooling the climate by geoengineering, this is the one that is most worrying because you're releasing a lot of aerosol into the stratosphere. 
the aerosol particles remain in the stratosphere for months, you have to, having, having released the, the, the aerosol, you have to sit there and wait until the aerosol falls out of the stratosphere and then you apply some more. But as, as, as it falls out of the stratosphere, it may be doing harmful things. It may be affecting local weather um, or the monsoon or something like that. We, whatever it's doing, you can't do anything about it until it's all dropped out of the atmosphere. Whereas with marine cloud brightening, you're pumping the, there's these finely uh, divided water particles into the cloud. But as soon as you, anything happens that you don't like, you simply stop pumping and uh, you, you've, the, the effect stops. So you can immediately deal with any untoward response that the atmosphere has. Yes, uh, I agree. It's a uh, marine cloud branding is advantageous in that it can be um, more easily tested without uh, unforeseen adverse consequences. And I think that's uh, why, uh, rightly so, uh, experiments of, on stratospheric uh, aerosol injection are being contested. And uh, also, we have to really uh, wait carefully whether to even allow such experiments to start. So I'm completely uh, in agreement with uh, the UK team on that front. And if we were to test any uh, you know, atmospheric based method, marine cloud branding would be the safer way to go. And uh, so now if we, we may speak about the mere reflection and it's even a safer method to test because in fact, we can do it in your backyard. And that's uh, uh, exactly more or less what our students have done this summer. So if uh, they would permit, I would like to show a couple of slides on that. Sure. All right, thank you. <laughs> so here we have, um, uh, two mirrors installed uh, at the Plymouth State University in New Hampshire by a group uh, where D uh, Dave uh, works. So he's working with uh, Lisa Donner, uh, P uh, one of the PI there, uh, and uh, uh, Jessica Morgan. So you can see Dave taking some uh, uh, just a radiation measurement uh, by hand uh, behind one of the mirrors there. And, and also uh, there are some interesting phenomena, including uh, some uh, heat, uh, buffering effect of the supporting infrastructure, you can see dew forming uh, on the uh, top of the mirror at the center. And here are some like very preliminary data of, uh, um, that we collected comparing the temperature of the soil uh, in a control field at 10 centimeter depth compared to the temperature uh, underneath uh, the small, very tiny mirror array. And we can see a very substantial difference at 10 centimeters, uh, several degrees. And that's a, a one month of data. We can also uh, have another measurement point at the standard 25 centimeter depth, and uh, the uh, difference is also very significant. So, of course, the response is attenuated because the ground acts like uh, a filter. And then here are the uh, temperature anomaly plotted, and we see very significant cooling by up to like five degrees Celsius on very hot and sunny days. So, we know uh, uh, that locally, these devices are very uh, strong. They provi provide a very strong local radiated forcing in the right direction in the current uh, climate. And here is uh, another view of the data in terms of probability density for um, the two different depths. And we have uh, you know, roughly on the order of uh, three quarters of a degree cooling. So, but this is a small mirror. What, what are you suggesting in terms of a larger scale? I, it's hard to understand how this would scale up. Uh, so this will be able to scale up for uh, all engineering reasons we have considered. One of which is even if we were to implement the solution using fossil fuel based uh, manufacturing, each mirror can cancel 10 times the carbon emission associated with its manufacturing and installation and maintenance. And of course, the major uh, energetically uh, expensive step in the manufacturing is the melting of glass. And that has been demonstrated to be solar powered. So you can do that using solar energy. And when uh, we you know, have policy to support that effort, we can um, expect the amount of CO2 canceled by each mirror to be like 50 times uh, what's used in its manufacturing. And we also have enough uh, solar line glass reserve in the world for this uh, endeavor. Uh, in fact, we have enough to cool the earth and maintain the temperature at the uh, 1750 baseline 
uh, pre-industrial baseline for up until an atmospheric CO2 concentration of 1000 ppm. So <laughs> scalability uh, is not a problem. And we also have uh, more than enough land to do this, especially uh, cropland that are now undergoing drought. So one good thing about the drastic local temperature reduction that we've seen is that uh, the need to cool themselves through uh, evapotranspiration from the plant is reduced and there will be significant, there would be, uh, we haven't demonstrated that, but we expect based on our reading of the literature and plant physiology, there would be very significant water saving for agriculture. So in the end, when you implement these arrays into fields, not only do you get an uh, increased uh, production, you also save water and at the same time, you provide uh, uh, planetary global cooling benefits. So that's uh, how uh, the mirror reflection project is um, scalable and feasible. So to be clear, you could actually grow things underneath these mirrors, even though it's shading. I, how does that work? Uh, yes. So uh, the fundamental reason on a very simple uh, level is that uh, many plants do not need all the photon flux that they receive in a day. In fact, they have mostly saturated for many uh, crop species. So the uh, what's really uh, limiting a production in many cases is this excess heat and the requirement for water. And the, the drought is a much uh, worse killer for plants. And uh, if you have already more photons than you need, then you don't need 100 you know, percent of uh, exposure. So if we cover, say, 10, 20 percent, uh, the plants don't feel it from a photon availability point of view, but they feel the benefit of the cooling and the less water stress. Well, we certainly know drought is going to be a major problem. <laughs> and so anything that, right. that allows growth without as much water is welcome. Uh, that mirror method looks very attractive. Okay, so we admire each other's projects. <laughs> and we we thank both of you very much uh, for your work and uh, hope hope that you can get some kind of funding uh, for both projects, the Marine Cloud Brightening and the Mirror Reflection Project, um, and also for uh, working with our oceans in, in different ways going forward. I would also like to add to that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Peter for all the decades of work you've put into this. You and many others, including uh, Guy McPherson, are the people that inspired me to take the leap of faith and the transition away from my original field of nanoscale engineering applied physics to really apply my learning and knowledge to this attack for this wicked problem. So uh, thank you for uh, being a teacher and a leader in the field and uh, for your continued uh, hard work. And uh, also we are also you know, working sort of together trying to draft letters to address you know, global leaders, not that they would listen to us or understand even the problem, but we, we try our best. And uh, yeah. I'll write to you about oysters sometimes. <laughs> we'll all be eating oysters in the future. Okay, thank you both very much.